Okay, we're going to continue looking at hardware this week. Um, we're going to right now we're going to look at the CPU or central processing unit. So every computer has one. Most electronic devices have them. Uh, it's also known as a microprocessor, and it has four main processing steps. So the four main processing steps are fetch, decode, execute, and write back. And we're going to go into each of those in depth. So fetch. And that's just what it sounds like. The processor basically goes to somewhere in memory or off of a hard drive. It is essentially it's requesting information at this stage. It says, hey, I need something to work on. Uh, so it grabs an instruction from memory um, and basically a program counter keeps track of which instruction to fetch. So what that means is as it's working through a big chunk of information to process, so say you've written a program, each step in that program requires the processor to do something. So as it's fetching an instruction from the program, it's a, it uses a counter to keep track of what line in that program uh, it's on. So decode. Once it's grabbed a piece of information, an instruction, it decodes it. It basically um, takes the machine code and turns that into some kind of action. So, you know, it moves some information, it does some, some multiplication or something. And one thing to know is that machine code is not the same thing as assembly language. I've seen a lot of things online that seem to say assembly language and machine code are the same thing. They're not, they're different. Um, to illustrate that, um, assembly looks like this. It's uh, what's known as a mnemonic. That's this. It's basically moving something from here to here. And that's, that's sort of what assembly language looks like. Machine code is binary. Machine code looks like this. And this instruction would be translated like this when it was machine code. So those things are different. Um, and just, just a point, just something to know. Uh, you can also write this in hex, but we haven't talked about the base 16 number system, so I'm not going to get into that. So moving right along. Decode. Once we have an instruction, it's decoded. So a compiled program is represented as machine code. And uh, we already talked about that. Machine code is not the same thing as assembly language. So basically the, what, how an instruction is set up is you have an opcode and a payload. Now that's my own term. So basically the opcode is uh, an operation code. It's something like move this data, uh, add one register to another, um, you know, do some kind of operation. Basically, the, there are a, a limited number of things that the processor can do with data in order to get some useful information out. Then we get to execute. Now, basically, this is taking this information. So once you've decoded it, you'll end up with like an opcode. And so if it says like multiply blank, it's sort of saying multiply is the opcode and blank is the payload. So whatever instruction the, the processor has fetched, that's what it contains. Execute. Now this is where it performs whatever operation the opcode indicated should be performed. Often this uses the ALU, which stands for Arithmetic Logic Unit. If you haven't noticed by now, computer scientists really like initialisms. The Arithmetic Logic Unit is just what it sounds like. It's a piece of the processor that does math functions, basically. Anything to deal with, you know, addition, multiplication, subtraction, uh, floating point arithmetic, that's anything with a decimal point is particularly hard for a computer, and it will also handle that. Um, various parts like the ALU and what have you are all connected using a data bus, but we may get to that later. The final step of the four step process is write back. So essentially that's just what it sounds like. It writes back any information that needs to be written. So it it's the results of the execute step are written back to disk or to RAM, kind of like we talked about last week. Uh, it could also be written to the cache, which we're going to talk about right now. So different types of memory. There's a hard disk drive or HDD that we've kind of talked about last week. This is cheap and it's slow. It's so slow it doesn't even count as memory because you have to have something, some memory that works at a similar speed to your processor and the processor goes through many 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 instructions a second and the hard drive just can't keep up. You have random access memory or RAM that we talked about last week. This is cheap and slow compared to other types of memory. It's still significantly faster than a hard disk drive, and I mean much, much faster. We're talking a sports car versus being on foot kind of scale here. 
And then you have internal cache. This is something that's attached to the processor. So it's not only physically close, which actually makes a difference, but it's also very, very fast. And because it's so fast, it's kind of expensive. The hardware and engineering necessary to make it quick also makes it expensive. Sort of if a hard drive is walking and RAM is being in a race car, this is being in like a fighter jet or something that goes, you know, multiples of the speed of sound. These things are really, really fast. There are usually a couple of different levels. When you go to buy a processor, you'll see oftentimes it'll say it has 8 megabytes of L1 cache or, you know, 32 gigabyte or 32 megabytes of L3 cache. These are usually small, but they're really fast. You can kind of figure out what size it is based on the number so if it's a three it's going to be bigger than a one and it, you can kind of think of it like a pyramid or like a layer cake the higher up you go the smaller they get but the faster they are uh yeah larger also means slower typically so again lather rinse repeat it goes through all those cycles over and over and over again forever so the cpu basically goes fetch an instruction then the next cycle it decodes it to the next cycle it executes it then the next cycle it writes it back and then it grabs another one it goes fetch decode execute right back fetch decode execute right back over and over and over again this is an example of a risk pipeline that's a reduced instruction set computer pipeline we'll maybe talk about that more later we're kind of just kind of skirting the edge of what is uh, required for this class. This is a very, very large topic though. Um, you could actually get a PhD in risk architecture stuff. There's so much information there. It's, it's a huge, huge, huge field. So speed, CPU speeds are measured in Hertz. That's how many cycles per second. And a cycle is, of course, one of those fetch, decode, execute, or write back cycles. Um, here, cycle is one of the previous steps. Fetch, decode, execute, and write back. A modern AMD processor, as of this month, uh, runs at 4.7 gigahertz. So remember from last time, uh, the kilo prefix, so like kilobyte, kilohertz, that's a thousand. Mega is a million. Giga is a billion. And terabyte is a quadrillion. So a modern AMD processor, as I said, runs at 4.7 gigahertz. That's this number. That's 4 billion 700,000 instructions a second. So every second it goes through 4 billion, almost 5 billion of those fetch, decode, execute, write back cycles per core. More on this in a second. So speed, a MacBook Pro, a brand new MacBook Pro laptop as of October 2013, for the non-retina display you can get it 2.4 gigahertz versus 2.7 gigahertz. That's a difference of about 300 million hertz or an 11.8% difference between the two. That's not a huge difference. This is something to keep in mind when you're buying a processor or a computer. A lot of times places like Fry's or Best Buy will try and sell you a computer that's faster because it's, you know, a 2.7 versus a 2.4. In the long run, in the grand scheme of things, that's not that big of a difference. Modern computers, like any kind of modern, reasonably priced, and by reasonably priced, I don't mean cheapest, I mean like sort of moderately priced computer, anything, they're, they're pretty comparable. The only time this really gets in, uh, to be a big difference is if you're building your own system. Like if you're building a, like a dedicated uh, gaming rig or like something to process graphics or something like that, then you might be really concerned with speed. But if you're just buying a computer for home, not that big of a deal. Um, and I'm kind of simplifying this a little bit because like I said, this information is, well, there are f at least four classes that cover this information in an undergrad level at a bachelor's level in computer science. And we would barely scratch the surface in that. And this course is just sort of a survey to kind of give you an idea of the information that's available. So I want to talk about Intel turbo boost and overclocking. Overclocking refers to increasing the rate at which the CPU clock runs. Now I didn't really talk about the clock too much. Basically what the clock is, it's what keeps track of these cycles. That's what this is. This is the clock speed. The gigahertz rating is the clock speed. So each cycle, each one of those 2.7 gigahertz, each one of those is, you can think of it like a clock tick. 
So each time the clock cycles, each clock tick is one of those cycles. So overclocking refers to increasing the rate at which the CPU clock runs. So where it said 2.4 gigahertz, you would kind of inch that up a little bit. The first in fact, the first gigahertz processor, or first processor to run at a gigahertz that was a commercial processor, was an overclocked AMD processor. And one of the problems with overclocking, one of the reasons why it can be dangerous, is if you're just somebody like you or me, and you're going through and you're overclocking your chip, it gets hot because it's running faster, it's pushing more electricity through it so it can heat up. Um, a little bit of trivia, I worked at Best Buy for a time uh, right around when the Intel Pentium 3 processors came out, or might have been the Pentium 4s. They ran so hot that they melted and it got really hot where I used to live and so the processor actually melted, like it stopped working, we opened it up and it was in two distinct pieces and it had melted in the middle. So most CPUs are slowed down to manage temperature. So what happens when they're manufactured, they're put into a test area, they see how fast it can run within a certain thermal load, and then that's what they market it as. So if you go to buy a new CPU and it's rated at 3.5 gigahertz, it may have the potential to run at four, but for whatever vagaries of the way it's assembled, it may have to be clocked down, as they say, this, the clock is basically slowed down so that it will run at a lower temperature. Intel offers something called Turbo Boost, which is essentially controlled overclocking. This is something that you'll see on Mac computers. Basically, it's they've tested these chips out to see, well, you know, it can run, it's a 2.7 gigahertz chip, but it can run at 3.5 for 45 minutes, and it's fine. So... Basically, that's what Turbo Boost is. If you're doing something like rendering video, playing games, or something like that, if you have a, a MacBook Pro and you're doing something heavy like this, all of a sudden the fans will kick on and it'll start heating up. That's one of two things. Either the Turbo Boost thing is active or it's uh, running the, the discrete video card, but that's, that's another topic for another time. So I want to talk about cores and threads. 